Hi, everybody. My name is Tamara Nimkoff, and I am an IDC state liaison and TA specialist uh, in evaluation and data use, and I'm so glad that you could join me to talk about strengthening the implementation of your SNP evaluation and the documentation of results. Um, a little um, housekeeping first. Um, after welcoming you, I just want to make sure that everyone knows, as you saw in the chat box, that we are recording this webinar. The slides of the recording will be available on the IDC website. Um, I'll show you where that is in just a moment. And um, to keep the quality of this recording, all the participant audio lines are muted. So when you have questions or comments, which we really encourage, please just jot them into the chat box. And as Sophia has said there, um, just um, make sure that you send to all participants, please. And then just as a preview, at the end of this uh, presentation, we're going to have a really brief online evaluation. It only takes a minute, and we would be so appreciative of getting your input. So where to find the webinar slides and the recording when we're done. Um, you'll just go to the IDC website at idadata.org. You can click on the events. At the top of the page, you'll have an option that to view past event recordings and materials. And then just select today's webinar title. It will open up a page like this one where you'll find a link to the recording from today on the right side of the page and there'll be a PDF version of the, PD, of the presentation slides, um, which is great for reviewing later or for sharing with colleagues who um, couldn't make it today. Okay, so let's get started. Um, it is our goal that participating in this webinar today will result in some improved understanding of common challenges when implementing and documenting SIP evaluations, an increased awareness of strategies for addressing common ESSIP evaluation challenges, and increased awareness of relevant IDC services and resources that can be used to support ESSIP evaluation activities and reporting. So over the next 45 minutes or so, um, <clears throat> I'll briefly review just the general expectations of the ESSIP, reviewing where we are in that broader ESSIP cycle. And then we'll discuss some of these common challenges that states face in implementing and documenting their ESSIP evaluation um, and strategies for addressing these challenges, including some of the resources that we have used in the provision of, of TA. Um, we'll, I'll share some information on um, TA services relevant to the ESSIP. And then we'll have time set aside for questions and comments sharing at the end. But as I mentioned, um, because we're not using the audio lines, please jot any questions or comments you have in the chat box by sending it to all participants. And um, you know, to the extent possible, we really do encourage just comments and questions along the way. We don't have to have, save them for the end. We just have a little time available for that. Um, so please feel free to comment um, along the way. Um, and then lastly, as I mentioned, we're going to um, uh, do a very quick evaluation poll after I'm done that will just um, gather feedback, and I will have signed off for that. <clears throat> so first, just a very quick recap of where we are in the SIP. Um, you know, also known as indicator C11 or B17, and yet, um, as we know, so much more than that. Um, the ESSIP is really a multi-year effort to improve results for children and youth with disabilities through statewide systemic change. Um, so we have passed through phases one and two of the ESSIP, and we're currently in phase three. We're actually in year three out of four years of phase three. And phase three is really about implementation of ESSIP activities and the results of ongoing evaluation and revisions to the ESSIP. So under this umbrella of implementation and evaluation, it's evaluating the extent to which your state has made progress toward or met ESSIP intended outcomes, including progress toward achieving that SIMR. Um, providing a rationale for any revisions that have been made 
or that your state intends to make to the SNP as a result of the uh, evaluation data, um, or if your state is continuing on its path of implementing the SNP, documenting or demonstrating how data from your evaluation support that decision. And then as part of the SIP, describing meaningful stakeholder engagement throughout all of implementation and evaluation activities. So um, the SIP is reported through annual submission, and the upcoming submission, which you see here is due Monday, April 1st, 2019, will be the third annual report within this phase three. So it's reflecting the work of year three, the phase three. So each report includes progress updates since the last submission, so this April submission is going to focus on what has occurred during this year three, which we're soon going to be concluding. So over the last years, we at IDC have worked with numerous states as they implement their SIPs and as they gather data to evaluate their progress and their results. And you know, throughout this process, um, uh, directors and lead agency coordinators have many, many decision points, including in relation to challenges in the SF evaluation. And so based on our uh, most recent work and TA with states, I'm going to discuss a number of common challenges that states face when implementing and documenting the SF evaluation. And we'll share some strategies for addressing these challenges. They're strategies that have come from our TA with states and that we have um, seen states incorporate themselves. And during the process, we'll just note, I'll note some of the resources that we've used when providing that TA on these issues. And as I present, I just want to acknowledge that, um, you know, I recognize that joining this call are folks with varying degrees of experience with the SIP. For some, this is very new territory. You may have new responsibilities um, for documenting activities or for making sense of evaluation data around outcomes that are themselves fairly new to you. And so my hope is that by unpacking some of these common challenges and sharing some of the useful strategies that have been used, it will help you anticipate and avoid some of these common issues. Um, we also realize that many of you have deep experience with the SIP. Um, perhaps you've led or worked closely with the SIP in your state for many years. And for you, this may be an opportunity to take stock of where your SIP evaluation data are and think about um, if you're getting what you want to out of the evaluation for informing your scale up, for informing your sustainability plan and considering if there might be some relevant uh, strategies that could um, be incorporated into your state process. So one common challenge that we've experienced with um, states is the issue around collecting high quality data for the SF. Um, the issue of quality, of course, kind of manifests itself in numerous ways, but one challenge among states has been ensuring that they have site-based or local data that are accurate and timely and complete. Um, for example, comparing data across different or changing measures. You know, some states have found that when districts are not required to use specific measures, like benchmark assessments, for example, that variation in the tools makes it difficult to compare the data or to group those data together to run analyses. And several states have faced the challenge of effectively capturing these local data to monitor the kind of cross-site progress on the broad scale that's really required in the SF. Another aspect of this challenge of quality is concerns about data coming from local sites. So um, in this way, the quality of data coming from local sites may limit the state's ability to use those data with confidence. So this might be difficulties getting local staff to collect and report accurate data or to share data in a timely way. 
Um, sometimes this is related to the burden on local staff. Um, for example, if they have to administer multiple administrations of a tool to assess change in practice. Um, sometimes it's related to, an, to a lack of understanding about the data collection process or it may just be a lack of some accountability mechanism for the process. And sometimes access to data from other sources that were not initially identified for the SIP, but you know, could inform progress can be a challenge. So that might include other indicator data or it might that the state is hoping to obtain to inform or other child or student level data, for example. So in working with states over the past year that have faced challenges in this area, you know, we've suggested some potential strategies and of course we've seen um, states address these challenges in a number of different ways. <clears throat> so some of the strategies that states have used to, to um, address the quality of SF data by like intentionally improving accuracy, timeliness, or completeness um, are here. First, provide a protocol for data collection to explain and standardize collection procedures. So some states have created and provided um, a protocol, a written protocol, that identifies procedures on how data should or will be collected and how the data will be used. And by making this protocol very specific, such as having a timeline and individuals responsible, et cetera, it's given the guidance to the locals um, that is needed and standardized the process to ensure the quality of the data coming back to the state. Um, <clears throat> this might be helpful, for example, in the administration of um, fidelity measures. Um, just as one example. Another strategy that has been employed is to use a process such as a rubric to analyze local data in consistent or comparable ways. So for example, this is a, a, a way of capturing local data from different data sources on a more aggregate level. So students moving between categories like um, into a proficient achievement category. Um, that might be a way of grouping data from multiple, from different uh, benchmarks into more global categories. So the specific data at the local level can be maintained for their local decision making, but the broader analysis can show um, comparable information needed at the state level. And one thing that we always will recommend and have seen states use effectively is to increase the kind of the confidence and the quality of the data that they're getting or that's going into that categorization is to provide local sites you know with guidance on selecting valid and reliable measures. So a third strategy is um, for states that have local sites that are challenged to meet the expectations of reporting um, data is to provide data analysis support. This can really ease the burden for the individual local sites by offering um, support with management and analysis. So it might mean providing locals with a structured way to manage their local data, such as electronic files or spreadsheets, um, or providing guidelines on how to analyze the data, or even um, providing support with the analysis itself. <clears throat> a fourth strategy is that many states have um, found can improve uh, challenges in local data quality is to really make linkages for people who are providing the data, that the data really are part of the implementation process. So showing how the data are being used at the state level, but also importantly, how they can use the data to improve services within their local programs or district. For example, by like setting up feedback loops to quickly identify and resolve issues with implementation. Um, in one uh, state, 
uh, in which we have engaged after experiencing some difficulties kind of obtaining pilot data, um, data from pilot sites, the state kind of stepped back and, and strategized for scaling up to additional sites by thinking, what do we need to include up front about um, how the data is a part of the implementation process in order to lay out the benefits of, of the uh, process and then um, provide that you know, additional support for implementation um, and really getting the buy-in for the collection and the analysis and the use of the data at the very beginning. <clears throat> Finally, a, a fifth strategy is just, it's really important to just revisit and reflect on your overall data quality processes. So for example, um, thinking about how as part of the ESSIP evalu evaluation, how do you support or address quality of your site data? Um, and this is, can be both you know, state and local level issue. Um, have you provided communication and training needed to make sure um, that uh, folks at the district, the local program level, um, are really understand the whole process from data collection through use and reflection? Um, do you have procedures in place to check for the completeness and the accuracy and the timeliness of evaluation data? And it, like, is this done at the state level or the local level? Um, Sometimes this is embedded if the data coming in are indicator related to other indicators. This is a part of the state's process. But we also know that much of the data for the ESSIP evaluation come from other data sources, um, <clears throat> sources around um, you know, family, sources around educator or provider practice. Um, state created sources. And so it's equally important to make sure to have processes for those data as it is for your broader indicator data. And we really find that when states revisit processes in these ways, that they can um, you know, find areas to improve the quality of their evaluation data. I wanted to mention at this point as I continue, um, just a reminder that please, as we're talking about challenges and strategies, I know that I, we move through them, I'm moving through them kind of quickly, but um, don't hesitate if there's something that occurs to you um, that resonates, that it's either a challenge that you've experienced or a strategy that you've used, or if you've used a strategy of a different nature to address the challenge of this in this area please feel free to um, share that. So a second common challenge area for states that we come across in our TA and our reviews of ESSIPs is um, collecting relevant data to address long-term outcomes. Um, looking at um, the 24 um, SEA LEAs that OSIP identified for targeted or, or intensive support in relation to the ESSIP, in their most recent review, almost all included demonstrating progress toward the simmer as a factor. And for example, a state may be lacking um, relative progress monitoring data aligned with the reading achievement simmer. Um, perhaps there's a state that has a graduation simmer and they need to capture data to inform progress around that or towards that such as uh, attendance and retention data, um, data from year to year. Um, another example would be um, data on parenting strategy use to represent a kind of a necessary link between the provider practices and early childhood outcomes. So meaningful data, um, either at child, family, student level, or in system change that can show how those, those changes are aligned with and impacting the simmer. In some instances, um, this is because 
identifying long-term outcomes for children and students and families and systems change um, is the challenge. The state has not identified these kinds of long-term intended impacts beyond the simmer itself. And, and now in this phase of year three, as we're sort of ending year three in phase three and really going into the last year of phase three, this is really a point of implementation of the SIP where scaling up is happening and to other sites and states are really um, needing to plan and work towards sustainability in those implementing sites. Um, but in doing so, some have realized that they need a clearer sense of what those long-term impacts are in the coherent improvement strategies or what improvements are in place to support and sustain the, that high quality education or the EI services over time. So in other instances, um, states have identified long-term outcomes um, and sometimes a whole host, a whole bunch of them. Um, but oftentimes this was done early in the SIP process, in the planning process, back in phase two planning, and um, they may still have challenges, though, collecting and reporting meaningful data on those long-term intended improvements to, to really assess progress towards the simmer. So for challenges with having relevant data to address um, intended outcomes, I'm going to briefly just talk about three strategy areas. Um, <clears throat> the first is using a logic model to anchor the ESSIP activities and evaluation. Second is refining indicators of progress and results. And the third is using data inventories. So when working with an ESSIP, the first thing really that we, the IDC evaluation TA specialists and, and several of them, of my colleagues are on the webinar with me, what we usually do is look for the logic model. Is there a logic model? What are the intended outcomes identified in the model? Um, using a logic model to anchor the SIP activities and the evaluation is a valuable tool for many reasons. One is that you identify the sequence of intended outcomes that are aligned with that chosen simmer. That's the way to articulate or specify what those intended outcomes are. So a logic model um, will lay out the objectives for implementation, like your activities and your short-term outcomes, and your impacts, your long-term results for children, students, families, systems. By laying out your objectives um, in implementation impact, in, it informs then what data you're going to collect and, and how you're going to analyze it. So the specific outcomes that you identify inform what data would be relevant for determining the extent to which those results are achieved. Um, one of the elements that OSIP has noted is uh, sometimes missing from, from state ESSIP submissions is a clear description of how the reported activities and the evaluation data relate back to the theory of action. <clears throat> a logic model helps put specificity to a theory of action by showing, as I mentioned, those specific components that are systematically connected. So in our work with states, um, understanding you know, the specific intentions of an ESSIP often requires kind of digging deeper than the level of a theory of action. Um, for example, we want to, we look at what are the specific goals of the ESSIP for children, students, families, long-term systems change in addition to the SIMR. Um, some of those examples I mentioned, a SIMR focused on reading achievement, you know, what are the related outcomes in student ongoing progress monitoring, et cetera. <clears throat> so a logic model can be used as an anchor for this discussion. And um, if, it's, if it is not in existence, we often will encourage 
the creation of that. And sometimes we find that um, we need to reassess and refine a current logic model. So while a state might have a logic model, the outcomes, as I mentioned, were identified early on. And so this is a time for reflection as that scaling up is occurring and, and sustainability plans are put in place. So if the data gathered from the initial implementation years has just like not hit the mark on what the state is really needing to show progress on, then, the, then reassessing and refining and considering if it would be helpful to revise the logic model um, is uh, a strategy. Um, in RTA around, well, in general, but specifically around um, logic modeling and this process, we have, we often use, we have many like resources that are publicly available, IDC, and we make them publicly available so that states can continue to use them on their own um, or choose to use them independently, which many indeed do. Um, so I want to share just a couple of these uh, resources that are relevant to this strategy area with you. So the guide to ESIP evaluation planning um, provides um, considerations for how to incorporate uh, nine steps for implementing a well thought out plan for evaluating the ESIP. And this includes linking the step of linking activities to outputs and to, and to outcomes, um, such as by creating a logic model. And the logic modeling in this process is a step, is one step that then leads to developing evaluation questions, selecting your design, identifying data collection strategies, analysis, et cetera. Um, this guide also has a series of editable worksheets that um, can be used for planning and documentation. Um, including templates for logic models, as well as um, worksheets that then link the outcomes that were developed through a logic model to those next steps. So worksheets that take the outcomes from the logic model and then link them to um, progress indicators, to evaluation questions, et cetera which we're going to talk about in a minute. Another resource that um, can help you as you reflect on what elements you have in place or not in place in the ESSIP evaluation, um, including you know, how you're linking your activities to outcomes, is this self-assessment tool, operationalizing your ESSIP evaluation. This is um, like an interactive rubric that we've used with states or that states have just used independently to identify gaps and then inform what specific actions they can take as they move forward. For example, um, do they need to identify their long-term outcomes? Do they need to um, link those outcomes to progress indicators, et cetera? Um, so that is another tool that we wanted to mention. A second and um, strategy for this area is that when long-term outcomes might be identified, um, sometimes states have challenges identifying relevant data because um, they have not um, articulated the specific indicators of progress or indicators of results. Um, that um, define those outcomes. So um, outcomes themselves are often not directly measured. They're only reported on. So it's these progress indicators and results indicators that define how you know the intended outcome was achieved. Um, just to note, we also refer to these as performance indicators. 
and that might be you you may yourself hear or use the term performance indicators. Um, so identifying effective indicators is a strategy um, because an effective indicator tells you something that you need to know. So indicators are a way to measure that outcome and they should be driven by the evaluation question that you want to answer. Um, an effective indicator is easy to understand, it's reliable, so um, your stakeholders as part of the SF process should be able to read uh, an indicator and know what specific change is being observed or measured and how progress made towards reaching that intended outcome is defined. And then effective indicators also should be aligned with accessible data. So a well-worded indicator will help you select the right measure, the right data source or tool that will capture the evidence you need. It helps you get clear about that, that type and that level of evidence you need. So it not only shows you, you know, the direction of the change that's happening, but it's also feasible to measure. So in some cases, um, states, okay, someone has, has asked me an example, in some cases um, states have had an indicator that may not have existing data to support it, and therefore it might be necessary to collect new data or to refine that indicator so that it aligns to existing and more readily available data. So someone has asked about an example of an effective indicator. And we have, there are, there are numerous um, Places for examples for these. In the guide to SF evaluation planning, we have um, a few definitions. We sort of have like a, what the a worksheet that defines this is what um, the components of a logic model. Um, and basically, an, ef an effective indicator would be it's got to be specific. Um, it's got to be observable and measurable. It's got to have some, so the evidence can be qualitative or quantitative, but often indicators have um, some kind of number of, percent of, ratio of, some kind of similar phrase of that, um, Alan. So like an example might be 95% um, <clears throat> of teachers measure student reading progress twice a week using the blank process, um, or 90% of families adopt at least one in-home approach to reach their child. Um, so those indicators would be um, linked or connected back to the evaluation question that you want answered around teacher implementation of practice or around family practices and would be a more specific measure of the broader outcome that you're looking for, such as, you know, teachers gain skills in this evidence-based reading practice and implement it with fidelity, or uh, families increase their use of positive strategies at home. Um, so hopefully that um, helps answer an example of an effective indicator. And I see that Adrian also has a question. Um, thinking back to the challenge of collecting local data, can you speak to the challenges of having data that is based on self-reporting by the local entity? That is an, a great question, Adrian. And, and um, self-reporting data in the SIP certainly is um, it, uh, one of the limitations that it is appropriate in your SIP to um, indicate as, as in the data quality issue, um, to indicate as a, a limitation. It's appropriate to do that. So um, one, one 
kind of question for you would be if the issue is around because the data are simply self-reported and just that in itself, you know, as a single data source has limitations, um, then if it's just about the issue of self-reporting, then certainly there are things that you can do to have like multiple data uh, sources to try to verify the self-reporting data. Maybe, for example, if you're getting um, measures, self-reported measures from the, the local programs, you could have a sampling or some intermittent um, uh, observation that would then provide some, some validation to those data to strengthen your confidence. Um, now, if the issue around self-reporting is that you're concerned about the real accuracy of those data, like how um, accurate sites are in either reporting it or if their self-assessments are off, then, then that could, would probably be addressed by strategies of local training and coaching. Um, either um, going back to the data collection protocol Sometimes an issue around the quality of, of the tool is that the local users may not fully understand um, the tool itself, you know, how to assess themselves appropriately, how to scale themselves. Um, so it really gets at the, if you kind of dig a little deep and get to the root of the issue, then that could help inform the strategy. Um, hopefully that's helpful, and certainly if you have a specific issue, we're happy to follow up on that um, on an individual basis. Um, thanks, Misty. Misty is asking, um, do any of the resources you're providing or will provide have example indicators related to family satisfaction that is not collected through surveys? Huh. Um, that's a great question because we, we know that that is a common, a very common method of getting information from families. And um, I, I don't know if the specific resources, I am familiar with in um, some SIP practices that they, they may select other, other means of um, uh, assessing uh, families. Now, satisfaction, I'm not sure. Um, I don't know offhand. That's something Misty will have to look at, and maybe we can follow up offline and then get that information out. But thanks for asking that. Okay, so moving on to our third um, kind of specific strategy. Um, when situations where states may have long-term outcomes that they've identified, but they're still challenged to, to know if they're getting the most relevant data for those outcomes, it's useful to reflect on and refine um, those, um, <clears throat> the data that are actually being collected. So a data inventory, this is a screenshot of an example. This is not a published tool that we have, it's just something that our TA providers have used um, in collaboration with a few states. Um, a data inventory can help you link specific data elements and data sources to intended SIP outcomes and assess how well the data that you're collecting for the SIP actually address those outcomes. How well do those data actually answer the question that you need answered? How well, um, if you have progress indicators or performance indicators defined, how well um, does the evidence that you're collecting um, match those indicators? <clears throat> so using um, a data inventory can help a state reflect on the appropriateness of the, the data that are being collected. Um, so for example, you know, given those, the goals, thinking about the goals of your SIP, and the long-term um, change and thinking about your evaluation questions about those outcomes, 
how do the data that you're collecting actually provide evidence for those outcomes and answer those questions? So, um, and as part of the data inventory process, also, if they're not the right data, what needs to be done to get the right data? So using a data inventory this way, the state can, can assess that and document the evidence that they've, um, the decision that was made based on that assessment. <clears throat> I'm going to move on to another challenge area. And this is, for a number of states, um, a challenge has been demonstrating how ESSIP results are used to inform plans for moving forward. OSIP has emphasized that a key requirement of the ESSIP is how the data collected and reported by states is used as a rationale for either revisions or to support ongoing implementation. I mentioned that up front, and that, you know, that comes kind of, that's straight from the measurement table. Um, this is a continued element that, that um, they look for and um, has been a challenge for some states to effectively really demonstrate this. Um, we've worked with states that are looking to better use evaluation results to understand what's kind of operationally different about their system that then can inform planning for sustainability. Um, <clears throat> often the, the challenge is around making sense of large amounts of, of data, um, you know, including techniques for managing and using the data that are gathered. And then I would say third for many states um, that they may feel that their decisions are data informed, but there is a challenge to clearly describe and document how the data collected and reported do actually support their SIP decision making. <clears throat> so in supporting states to kind of demonstrate um, this use of data, um, we often start by simply having them reflect on specific ways that they use and document data in an explicit way. So, for example, um, asking questions of, you know, how are we assessing progress throughout the year in order to make those data-informed changes to ESSIP activities, to changes to strategies, changes to practices. So not, um, you know, what, what do we do in um, February, <laughs> because the ESSIP is due in April, but what is our process for um, assessing throughout the year? Um, what's the pro that process for making decisions about scale up or what's needed for sustainability, um, again, throughout the year? Um, for some states, you know, looking back, um, and reflecting on what systems change data, like benchmarks or other database indicators of change um, that they uh, are using on an ongoing basis to sort of understand and document what's operationally different about the system at the end of this ESSIP cycle. Um, and then, you know, how are we using that evidence from the evaluation to provide a rationale for specific changes and specific um, decisions. So two um, strategies that um, we have used that support the kind of documentation, this kind of documentation of database decision making is um, here, the first bullet to use a data meeting protocol, and um, the second to have a mechanism to address each component of data analysis and use. I'm going to talk through these. So using a protocol can guide conversation and facilitate decision making around data, including the asset. So this um, is an example. The IDC data meeting protocol is, is one example. It provides a simple structure that can be followed for, for um, conducting meetings and documenting the decisions and the action items of those meetings. So the protocol um, provides guidelines for organizing and making sense of data by discussing observations, interpretations, and implications of those data. And then importantly, it um, 
helps you determine and document, or guides the process, rather, of determining and documenting action steps, um, or any related action items. So um, making a protocol like this a regular part of certain team meetings, for example, is one way to build that use of data into the SIP. So it's not something done at the end of the year, but it's something that's part of just the ongoing process. Um, states have used this protocol to kind of facilitate and document their discussions around um, SIP process and activity implementation, and also data on expected outcomes. Um, in this process, we can also provide some editable templates and other tools that can help in, you know, can be used for planning and conducting these meetings, like action planning, et cetera. Carolyn asks, I see. Thank you, Kim. I think you were going to prompt me. I appreciate it. I saw, Kim, <laughs> <Yeah. yeah. laughs> I saw Kim's line on mute, and I thought, oh, she's prompting me. Um, Carolyn asks, will you be sharing specific examples for how states have implemented any of these tools as part of their ESIP implementation? Um, so Carolyn, the, the examples that I, that I am sharing are from um, experiences with individual states. Um, I'm simply just not um, naming the states because um, they're not presenting this information themselves. Um, but uh, we certainly have, um, there are, well, I, I, would, I would guess that there are people on the line now, actually, um, that uh, could easily comment and say, for example, you know, We've used the planning guide, or we've used the data protocol, et cetera. Um, and so, if if there are folks that would that would be willing to, um, you know, jot particular resources that they've used as part of their, um, that would be really helpful um, to Carolyn, and I'm sure to all other participants. Um, and if folks don't, Carolyn, I'm happy to. Um, yes. Yes, and in that case, I'm happy, I was just about to say, I'm happy to um, connect you with other states um, that uh, on that one-to-one -one basis so that you can um, connect with them and see what their experience has been. Absolutely, happy to do so. So another, um, I would say maybe broader strategy that we've used to support states and kind of um, demonstrating how results and form plans for moving forward is to have a mechanism for making sure that um, uh, a get each given SIP decision is linked to uh, the process of data analysis and use. Um, this is a cycle that we've used in our TA with states just to kind of be intentional about how they identify and analyze and use data for decisions and then document that process. Um, this particular cycle, you can see it has um, identifying the purpose for analyzing data, determining the primary questions that need to be answered, linking the question to relevant data that can answer it, collecting and analyzing the data, um, determining what process to follow to apply the results to your work and how those results will be communicated or shared. So situating your asset decisions within a cycle like this can help link those decisions back to the evidence from the evaluation. Um, one state uh, example, which I won't name, Carolyn, um, is that they're applying this broad process as a strategy for encouraging the more standard use of data um, throughout the ESIP at their different implementation levels within the ESIP, so state, regional, local. And we've worked with the state to create a kind of cycle of inquiry. It actually um, modifies this language a little bit, um, but it's a similar process that then is a series of steps to kind of guide the local implementation sites to making sense of their local data and using it for site-based decisions. And this this strategy is really a part of how the state documents how data is used to support ESIP decision making across the whole ESIP initiative. Um, and 
what we have right here in this link for more information, this hyperlink just happens to be to um, the in this slide header is to a recent IDC webinar that focused on state and local teams working together through this process. Um, not in relation to the ESSIP specifically for that webinar, but um, in relation to um, uh, relevant data. So as we wrap up um, this uh, discussion of common challenges and sharing of some of the strategies, um, I just want to mention um, one other thing, an opportunity that IDC is offering to states to have their drafts of their ESSIP submissions reviewed. Um, all the IDC state liaisons had, have already reached out by email to an SEA director or um, your lead agency coordinator um, to let them know that um, an IDC team is going to complete a thorough and is offering to complete a thorough and review, um, thorough review, excuse me, of um, draft ESSIP submissions and provide recommendations for completeness and quality and clarity of that. Um, that will base our feedback on OSEP guidance and expectations. So that was something I just wanted to mention. A number of state directors and lead agency coordinators have responded back already. Um, with their interest in this service. Um, so if that's something that you're not sure, that you don't know about is, has been um, a, a, an interest in your state, then you can check to see if yours has and, and just reach out to your state liaison um, with that. At this point, which I really appreciate, we've had so many co um, great questions and comments. Um, throughout the process that I think have been really valuable. Um, but are there any more other questions um, that folks might have? Other challenges that you wanted to share or strategies you used to share? Um, uh, Carolyn, you mentioned, mentioned about IDC-related tools or resources. If anyone wants to comment on that now, please do. Um, certainly, if not, we will. Um, I will certainly uh, reach out to Carolyn to connect her. I'll give folks a minute because I know sometimes I take a minute to pull my thoughts together. All right, Misty has a comment that it sounds as if it's permissible to change, revise long-term outcomes based on evidence if appropriate. So um, that's a great question, Misty. We, the, the logic model itself um, really is a living working document. Now it's it is not it it drives and anchors the 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 initiative and the evaluation of that initiative. So it, it has to have meaning. It has to have however um, that is an example of a logic model outcome being modified based on the evidence being collected and based on the experience throughout the years of the ESSIP is an example of ESSIP revisions or ESSIP changes, you know, based on data. And we have certainly worked with a number of states that have, I would say, refined and ref uh, their logic models um, to um, really better um, address and better reflect the initiative um, because, you know, if I knew yesterday what I know today. Um, now, um, I wanted to mention that um, Terry Long um, shared a comment, Misty, as an example to something that you asked, and I don't know if this went to everyone. She says, focus groups, focus groups can be a family satisfaction measure. That is not a survey. Great thought, Terry. Thank you. They're dependent on strong facilitation skills, of course, and are very resource intensive, so have limitations. But thank you, Terry. That's a great suggestion. Carolyn has another comment here. We've developed many of our own tools and used the CISIP Center resources for the development of our theory of action. That's great. She's interested in how states have found utility um, in the tools you've described as well. Okay. 
Great. Okay, so Carolyn has, um, that was her interest in hearing from other states around their experiences with some of the tools that we've mentioned. And that makes sense, Carolyn, and as I said, I'm happy to, um, to connect you with folks. Um, and then she also mentions that we're doing student focus groups for ours. Great. All right. So I'm going to, um, we've had so much great comments and discussions and questions. I really appreciate it. Um, we're going to keep going. If you have more comments or questions, then feel free to continue to add them into the chat, and, and we can always follow up with you later. <clears throat> So um, just a, to kind of go back to our uh, tools mentioned, um, accessing relevant resources in TA, um, you can find the tools I mentioned, but also others on the um, selecting SIP evaluation section of the IDA, of our IDC website under Knowledge Lab. And of course, reaching out to your liaison for any um, SIP evaluation reporting support. Um, we do, um, when we put out new tools and have events and things, we push things out through our social media site, Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, and just a quick recap, I'm hoping that today um, gave you us an opportunity for some improved understanding of some of the common challenges that were implemented um, when implementing and documenting SF evaluations, that there's an increased awareness of some of the strategies for addressing these common challenges and an increased awareness of some of the relevant services and resources um, that are available in this area. And thank you, Cindy, for noting that the building um, an ESSIP evaluation plan um, was helpful for you. And that is a resource. That presentation is saved and is in the um, resources section of, the, of our website. Thank you all very much for your time and your discussion. <clears throat>